I'm ready. Yeah. It's a great uh, honor for us to have uh, Dr. Ong from MD Anderson Cancer Center at the program. Uh, she's not just a rising star, but she established herself by now as a star of uh, pathology and uh, dermatopathology. She's originally from Burma and she did her medical degree there. And then she moved to Japan to do a PhD degree. And after that, she moved to the United States to work on cancer biology at Cleveland Clinic. She followed that up with a residency at probably the best place, you know, in the United States at the National Cancer Institute. And then she moved to a research track, a uh, dermatopathology program, which is a very unique one at Boston University. And she actually spent two years in fellowship, one year at research track and one year to do her fellowship. After that, in 2014, uh, she started to work for MD Anderson Cancer Center. She has numerous, she's very young, uh, but don't, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like a, a distractor because she has amazing amount of high quality publication. Whenever she starts on a work, she always finishes. And she's going to talk to us about uh, the American Joint Committee on Cancer TNM Staging Parameters, what is new in 2018 of cutaneous malignant no, pleasant. A uh, few thank you so much for taking uh, on my, you know, invitation, and and uh, please start your lecture. Thank you, thank you so much, Laszlo, for a very kind introduction. It's actually my honor to join this uh, great program. And first of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining this uh, webinar. So today, as um. Dr. Kara said, I'm going to talk about the new the AJCC TMN staging parameter as well as the updated uh, uh, CAP protocol. This is the College of American Pathology protocol for uh, cutaneous malignant neoplasm. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And so that this is the outline of my uh, talk for today. So I will, um, as I said before, I'm going to talk how to report cutaneous malignant neoplasm following recommendation by updated College of American Pathologists Cancer Protocol, as well as new eighth edition of AJCC, TM and staging and classification. So as you know, uh, until now we are using seven editions of AJCC, but starting from January of next year, 2018, we are going to switch to eighth edition of AJCC. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to like, highlight what's the difference between the current 1.7 edition and the new 1.8 edition of AJCC TM and staging and classification. So basically, first of all, I would like to uh, focus on the melanocytic lesion of post melanoma. If we have any extra time, I will talk a little bit more about non melanocytic lesion, especially Merkel cell carcinoma. And I will not be talking about squamous cell carcinoma because in the new AJCC staging system, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma, we don't need to report uh, as per AJCC anymore. It's only for the head and neck and GYN area squamous cell carcinoma, not for the cutaneous one anymore. So basically start with the melanoma. So, you know, that in, uh, in US in 2017, the melanoma or skin represent approximately 5.2% of all new cancer cases, as well as 1.6% of estimated deaths in, <clears throat> in US. And also you can see here this graph, the incidence of melanoma has been increasing uh, in US, but fortunately, you know, the death rate have been stable, most likely because we are detecting the melanoma cases in their early stages. And also, we have more effective treatment, not only the traditional, the surgical excision and the chemotherapy. Now we have more personalized treatments, such as like targeted therapy, as well as immunotherapy, even for the high-grade uh, melanoma cases. 
So here you can see this uh, 15 year survival cup. You see one can appreciate the uh, <clears throat> significant correlation between staging uh, and survivors of the patient with cutaneous melanoma. Here, if you move to this graph, you can see if the patient has localized disease, that means stage one or stage two disease, the survivor, mm -hmm. five year survivor is very good, almost 99%, but here it drops to 20% when the patient have distant metastasis. So that means stage four disease, right? So as and you know that the most of the staging is based on the clinical pathological parameter. So as a pathology, it is very important to examine each and every case as very detailed and then report all the clinically relevant parameter uh, for the management of that patient. So to assist pathologists that in providing the clinically useful and relevant information whenever reporting result of surgical specimen, the College of American Pathologists, CAP, offers protocol, uh, cancer protocol for various malignant neoplasm, including mm -hmm. the melanoma. Those protocols include both essential as well as recommended elements. And the, this current one or updated CAP protocol, which was posted in June 2017, was based on the eight additions of AJCCTM and staging system. That means the new uh, system. So, so uh, why this can, cancer template so important? Yeah, first of all, because these all information will guide the clinician how to treat that patient, right? And also for in especially in US, these um, cancer templates are required for accreditation by different um, uh, association, like for example, College of American Pathologists, and also <clears throat> like for us. Uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, we have to use this cancer template starting from 2015. So uh, in terms of pathology report of cutaneous melanoma, you know our, now our, we know more about these uh, that biology and pathogenesis of the tumor. So our pathology report became more comprehensive in terms of diagnosis, prognostic, and mutation information like a BRAF, right? Because that BRAF will uh, give the information to the clinician, the patient will uh, respond their treatment with an, uh, BRAF antibodies, right? And also that, that means we our report has been more important in clinical decision and also the treatment modality. So here you can see the example of our pathology report at MD Anderson Cancer Center for the biopsy specimen of the melanoma cases. So we usually report these 17 parameter, uh, including these 10 I highlighted in the red asterisk, as well as <clears throat> those asterisks are the C require element by CAP. And also the blue asterisk that I highlighted here, those are the required parameter by AJCC. And also you can see uh, the, the parameter that I didn't, um, I, <clears throat> I didn't highlight. Those are the just recommended element, not required element. So as I said before, we report both require and the um, <clears throat> recommended element by CAP as well as AJCC, okay? So here, these two I highlighted in orange box. You see the regression and perineural invasion. These two parameters uh, now we can require element by CAP, this updated edition uh, published in 2017. In the previous version, those are just recommended element, but that's the uh, uh, difference, right? And here we move to the next one. This is again, pathology report for melanoma, but this time is the for resection specimen. So it will include the uh, white local excisions of the lesion, as well as uh, uh, sentinel lymph node, or sometimes uh, if it is a uh, T1A melanoma, no sentinel lymph node. So this is the page number one of our report. And you can see in page number two, we report all these parameters. Again, the uh, red arrows mm -hmm. saying require element by CAP, and the, also the blue asterisk not require but recommended element by CAP. So we report everything and also, of course, TN and staging information at the bottom, as you can see here. 
Okay, so here let me talk a little bit about what AJCC, so American Joint Committee on Cancer, they make a staging and classification system. So basically that is the TNN staging system. T means primary tumor or localized tumor, it's stage one and stage two. N means regional match to the lymph node, to the regional lymph node, of course. That will be stage three. And M means distant metastasis or stage four disease. These TMN staging systems actually determine prognosis, treatment, and various enrollment in the clinical trial of the patient with melanoma. Okay, so I'm going to start with the T staging or primary tumor stage. So here I'm showing just a brief comparison between seven edition and the new eight edition. So here you can uh, easily recognize that my total rate I have been removed. So that means that my total rate is not uh, <clears throat> a um, staging criteria for the uh, in eight edition in melanoma. For, for the T staging, right? So let's talk a little bit more about that. So this is basically for the seven edition. You know, T category is basically, that means thickness, right? We have TIS, that is easy, that's the inside you. And we have T1 through T4 based on the thickness of the tumor, right? And T1 mean less than or equal to one millimeter tumor thickness, T2, one to two, and T3, two to four, and T4 more than four millimeter in tumor thickness. So you know, notice the here, see that thickness is a very powerful predictor of survival in patient with melanoma. You see that 10 year survival of the patient with localized disease, that means T1, only less than one millimeter. The 10 year survival is 92%, but it dropped to 50% if the patient has D4, that means tumor thickness more than four millimeter. Again, here you can notice that each stage in T1 through T4, we have an A and B based on present or absent of ulceration, right? And also, if you look at only T1, you will see not only the ulceration, you know, here how important the mitosis in the servant addition. So here, uh, the presence of one or more mitosis figure will upstage T1 lesion into T1A uh, from T1A to T1B based on these seven additions of AJCC. And next one, this is the eighth addition. Again, in new AJCC, there's a modification, right? Uh, in T1 melanoma by tumor thickness strata of 0 0.8 millimeter, right? Basically, so if a tumor with less than 0 0.8 millimeter without ulceration, that will be T1A, right? Or if the tumor is 0 0.8 to 1 millimeter uh, with or without ulceration, that will be T1B. And, and another uh, subtype for T1B is tumor thickness less than 0 0.8 millimeter with ulceration, right? So, and also in the T2, T3, T4 is very similar to seven edition, not much changes. So basically mainly in T1. And also uh, they clarifying the definitions of TX, T0 and TIS. Again, TIS we know easy inside you, right? And uh, T0 mean no evidence of primary tumor or unknown primary, right? And then TX is for the tumor when the primary tumor thickness cannot be examined exactly because that's, for example, the, uh, the specimen is very fragmented, mainly because the biopsy was uh, obtained through carat touch instead of rear punch biopsy, right? Those cases you have to say can uh, thickness cannot be examined um, uh, exactly, and then you have to say TX. Okay, and then let's move to the comparison of the pathology staging between AJCC7 and 8th edition, right? So here uh, in, in this orange uh, highlighted area, the rest is more or less the same uh, except the one that I highlighted in red color. Here you see in 7th edition, the patient with T1B okay, that means, for example, patient have the tumor thickness of let's say zip 0 0.9 millimeter, right? With ulceration or with mitosis, right? 
and but negative sentinel lymph node and no no metastatic are distant met metastasis, right? So that T1V and 0M0 is according to AGS uh, CC7 edition, it will be pathology staging 1B. But according to 8th edition, the same tumor, uh, it will be classified as the pathology staging 1A. So that's the main difference between 7 and 8th eight, eight edition for pathology staging, okay? And now, so not only that, in 8th edition, uh, to promote the consistency in measurement of the tumor thickness, especially for thick melanoma, it is recommended to round in the number of tumor thickness into one decimal place. What does that mean is, for example, here, if you see, T2 now is more than one to two millimeter, uh, as opposed to 1.01 to 2 millimeter based on the seventh edition. So that's the difference. And the other, like a little bit more uh, significant difference is, for example, if the one of the patient have a tumor thickness of 0 0.95 millimeter, right? Forget about uh, ulcerations and the mitosis right now. Just let's say 0 0.95 millimeter. Based on seventh edition, the patient has T1 melanoma, right? And then another patient has a, a tumor thickness of 1.04 millimeter. So based on seven edition, that patient has T2 melanoma, right? But based on these eight edition, uh, we are supposed to round in at the number to the decim uh, one decimal place. That means both uh, would be rounded as one millimeter. That means both patient has T1 melanoma. See, that's a different, okay? And now I want to talk about how we measure tumor thickness, right? So basically what we do is we use the calibrated ocular micrometer. So basically what we do is we put it at a right angle to the adjacent normal skin from the top of the granular layer all the way down to the deepest point of tumor invasion, okay? But for example, like this case, if you have a ulcerated melanoma, what you have to do is start from the base of the ulcer all the way down to the deepest point of tumor invasion, okay? And like, for example, this one, the tumor is like transected at the base. At that point, what you do is you are uh, reported the thickness to the deepest um, uh, deep margin and you report is like at least, let's say 0 0.5 millimeter. And then in the comment, you have to say the limitation mm -hmm. of the uh, thickness uh, assessment, right? Because the tumor present at the deep tissue edge, so you don't know how far it will go, right? And this is some of the pitfalls that we see on our review uh, for the like consultation cases. So basically, uh, this six, I'm going to talk each and every uh, one of these pitfalls and give you the same um, representative example. So let's start with the first one right, melanoma cell associated with a nexus structure. So for example, this one here. So you see here the, I, the, the cycle one, this is the melanoma just next to the follicle. And you see the stroma is the uh, perifollicular stroma, kind of a fibrotic stroma compared to the normal uh, dermis, right? So this one, uh, if normally what you, sh if you see any invasion, you're supposed to measure from the granular layer all the way to the deepest portion to here. But for this one, you cannot measure like that because this is just a perianexal extension of the tumor. So what you can do it, you can measure from the middle of the uh, hair follicle all the way here, or look for other invasive melanoma cell. Uh, away from the follicle. Like for this specific case, we have a uh, here invasive melanoma cell. So what you do is you measure from the granular layer to this one, and then you put the comment saying that you have a melanoma, which is melanoma cells, which is located deeper in the dermis, but you didn't include it in your measurement of tumor thickness because that melanoma cells are, are located in association with the annexus structure. Okay. 
And next one, this is the satellitosis. I will talk about the definitions of satellitosis later in my talk, but right now is example, this is the uh, satellitosis. If you have satellitosis, so you are not supposed to measure all the way down there. Instead of that, again, you trying to find the another, another invasive melanoma cells and measure from the granular layer to that point. And so basically the correct uh, tumor thickness measurement for this specific case is the A, not B. Okay, so you are not supposed to include satellite lesion as well as lymphovascular invasion, even they are present at the deeper dermis, right? The next one is tangential sessioning. You know, in daily life, you have to deal with these R uh, things like, for example, like artifactual cleft or tangential sessioning. So let's say this one. You know this is tangential sessioning because you see the squamous epithelium is supposed to be at the top of the specimen, but now this one is in the middle of the specimen. That means that the tissue was cut tangentially, right? So those cases, again, you cannot measure the tumor thickness, right? So what you have to say is tumor thickness cannot be measured accurately due to the tangential sessioning, right? Basically, you can say TX for these cases, right? And then in terms of the melanoma, especially the superficial melanoma, which can be associated with the uh, benign nevus component, you have to be careful those cases, especially like this one. You see the nevus component present at the deeper dermis compared to the melanoma cell. So basically for this one, what you have to measure is only the melanoma component, don't include the nevus component. That means the correct measurement is A, not B, okay? And then let's move to the next one. This sometimes you have to deal with that, like multiple fragments of the tissue in the same body from the same specimen of the of the same patient, right? You know these are the uh, tissue from the same patient from the same specimen. But here you see this fragment have an epidermis attached, and they doesn't have it. But both of them has a melanoma here. So what happened is like the clinician when they shave the biopsy first time they got this fragment and then they found the uh, residual pigment at the base of the previous shape. So they decided to go back and do another shape at the base of the previous biopsy. So that's what happened, right? If you have something like that, what, you know, uh, you cannot uh, like add these two and to get the breast low thickness, basically what you have to do is look for the fragment with the epidermis and measure from the granular layer to the deepest portion and then you report is at least in millimeter. You cannot call at B1, uh, like T1 plus T2 equal to T3. It doesn't work that way, okay? So the correct one is T1, and you will say at least in a millimeter, and in the comment you say the limitation of the tumor, uh, measurement of tumor thickness, okay? So this is the <clears throat> last bit for, for tumor thickness. Again, here you see. So basically, as we said before, from the granular layer to the deepest portions of melanoma, so that's fine. That is that this is B, right? But now we are having this artificial cleft. So this is not the real thickness of melanoma. So what you have to do is measure this separately, this A, and you have to subtract from the from B thickness minus A. So the correct one is B minus A, okay? And this is a, something a little bit controversial. Like everybody has kind of a different way of uh, saying. Like for example, for MD Anderson, if we have the perineural invasion, uh, we consider it's part of the primary melanoma. And what we do it, we we report two breast low thickness. Of course, if the perineural invasion, let's say if here doesn't matter because we are going to measure the thickest melanoma. Uh, right, uh, invasive melanoma. So, but in this case, you see the perineural invasion present at the deeper dermis compared to the uh, uh, invasive melanoma. So, as you see here, so what we do is we report both. One, we said to the area of deepest invasive melanoma cells, and like second one, like B, we use we said to the area of melanoma cell associated with perineural invasion. So, we report both. But that's not the standard method, but this is the way that we do at MD Anderson, okay? And let's move to the alteration. Okay, so I, uh, all the parameter, if possible, I would like to start with the definition, that knowing the def definition accurately and you 
can uh, avoid some of the pitfall, right? So for example, the acceleration. So histologically or microscopical definition of acceleration is the absence of the <clears throat> intent epidermis. Basically, you lost the whole uh, thickness of the epidermis uh, overlying the invasive component of melanoma and associated with serum crest as well as fibrinous exudate. And you know there's no previous trauma or surgery at this site because if there's something happened before, it's so difficult to differentiate is that tumor associated acceleration or the trauma related acceleration, right? So if you want to say something that has to be. And then let's move to uh, here, the next one. You see the uh, how important the acceleration in terms of prognosis in uh, melanoma patient. So here you see, uh, survival rate of patients with accelerated melanoma are proportionally lower than those without accelerated melanoma, even with the equi equivalent thickness, right? Like, and in addition, more interestingly, you see this example, for example, this blue line, right? The dark blue and the light blue. So dark blue is for the T2B, that main patient with tumor thickness, uh, <clears throat> one to two millimeter with acceleration, right? And the other one, the light blue is T3A. That means patient with melanoma, uh, tumor thickness of two to four millimeter, but without acceleration. But you see that survival is all, you see almost the same. So that what I mean is accelerated melanoma shows similar survival rate as NAST uh, <clears throat> T category with no acceleration. Right, so that's how important the acceleration is. That's why you know all the T uh, staging we divide it into A and B based on the acceleration, right? And in addition, uh, in one of the studies showed that in patient with stage one or stage two, uh, the ten year survival rate is um, about seventy eight percent if the tumor is not accelerated. But if the tumor is accelerated, the 10 year survival rate dropped to 50%. So again, showing how important acceleration in terms of the prognosis of melanoma patient, okay? So let's move to the uh, potential pitfall for in uh, measurement or assessments of the acceleration, right? So for example, this one, what I'm showing is transepidermal elimination mm -hmm. or some people call consumption of the epidermis. We don't as, as I said before, by definition, you have to see the loss of the whole thickness epidermis. We don't see that. We don't have a scale crest or um, uh, fibrinous exudate to, free, to fulfill that definition. So this is not the true acceleration, okay? So be careful. Again, if you move to next figure, you see the scale crest, but again, you still have the full thickness epidermis. You you didn't uh, you don't see any loss of the whole thickness epidermis. So again, this is not the true acceleration, right? Sometimes you see that the uh, the epidermis can be detached from the uh, uh, underlying tumor, right? So this is again just that uh, artificial detachment, not the real acceleration. Of course, in daily life, you can see like incomplete session. That means you don't see the whole epidermis. Some of the epidermis are missing, right? Or uh, as I said before, pro the acceleration related to prior trauma or prior surgical procedure in, uh, instead of true tumor-related acceleration. So please be careful when you interpret these important uh, histology parameter, okay? And now I'm moving to mitotid index. So basically, mitotid index is determined by identifying mitotically active area, and some people call it hot spot, right? It's in one millimeter square area. So it's usually um, uh, approximately four and have high power field in our Olympus microscope. But again, be careful, it varies from microscope to microscope, right? And we recommend looking at the entire session until finding at least one mitotid figure. And if you find at least one, and then you can count consecutive fields. And of course, we report in whole numbers, like two or three, not 2.5 or 2.6 like that, okay? And if no mitotid figure is identified, at MD Anderson, we report it as less than one. That means, basically, uh, uh, we don't find any, basically zero, but we report it's less than one, not zero. 
Okay, and here, as I said at the beginning, my total rate was removed as a staging criteria for T1 tumor, but remains an overall important prognostic factor as past eight editions of AJCC, okay? And uh, this is just uh, some potential bit for in evaluations of mitotic figure. So it includes like reporting average mitotic count in more than one millimeter square area, including like an, another one is uh, what we commonly see is including the mitotic figure from the area of dame epidermal junction or from the cells associated inflammatory or endothelial cells. Uh, in counting the mitotic count. So mitotic count has to be in the melanoma cell in the dermis, okay? And some people like uh, trying to report the key I67 or MIP1 positive cell as a mitotic count, that's, uh, that's not valid, okay? And you are not supposed to cut addition and session just to evaluate for mitotic count. And now moving on regression. So this is the, uh, as I said before, according to updated CAP, this is uh, uh, now essential parameter to report, not the recommended anymore, right? So basically, uh, I want to start again with the definition, right? So regression means replacements of melanoma cells in the dermis with fibrosis, vascular proliferation, lymphohistiocyte infiltrate uh, and melanophages with flattened or atroph uh, atrophic overlying epidermis. Okay, again, some people might say, you have so many criteria for the um, uh, regression. Do I need to have all these things uh, in the same patient? You, can, you, don't, uh, you don't need to have all the things. If you have like three out of these five or six parameters, mm -hmm. that will be perfect, right? And then when we report regression, so we report like focal or extensive, right? According to CAP guideline, the, the, uh, the cutoff point between focal and extensive is 75%. Basically above 75% extensive, less than 75% are focal. But at MD Anderson, we have a little different. The for sure, more than 75% is extensive. But if we have less than 75%, we try to report is like less than 50 or 50 to 75%. So we divide it into basically three groups less than 50, 50 to 75, of more than 75%, okay? And move to perineural invasion. Again, this is the new essential parameter as per updated CAP based on eight editions of HACC. So perineural invasion, what you do, you, uh, you report is present or not identified or indeterminate. And you might notice that we said present, uh, um, we don't say absent because you know um, just through most of the time uh, we dictate these things. So if you have like accents in English and like me, and then sometimes the whoever um, um, transcriptionist might make mistake like present absent. So to be like clear, we said present if it we see anything. If we don't see anything, we said not identified. Okay, just uh, to be like, uh, to avoid the mistake. That's the um, only thing, but you can notice that's what we use here. And let's move back to the perineural invasion. So we, if we see any perineural invasion, we're trying to say it's a small or medium or large caliber net fiber. Again, there's no specific cutoff point until now. Some people said if less than 0 0.1 millimeter should be small. No, but there's very subjected basically. But for now, what we are using is large caliber nerve fiber should, it has to be a really large nerve fiber. That means that nerve should have a name, like a fascia nerve, something like that, right? But small and medium, again, very objected. And then move to the next parameter. So these are the additional histology parameters, which are required to report as part CAP template, which I highlighted in red as straight in my prior slide, okay? So it includes types of the surgical procedure, right? So if you have more than one in the um, same uh, case, for example, you have the resection specimen as well as the sentinel lymph node biopsy, at that point, we, you should report both right? You, you can say re excision as well as the sentinel lymph node biopsy. So if you have more than one procedure in the same case, you have to report more than one. Uh, and also you have to report 
laterality of the specimen as well as location of the specimen okay in terms of the size of the tumor you have to report only if the tumor is grossly visible right so mainly you have to uh, report at least one greatest dimension if you have three dimension that's perfect right and also again satellite nodule this only for the excision specimen not for the biopsy and in terms of pigmentation gross right you can see grossly any pigmentation in that tissue specimen again this is only the recommended that's why i highlighted with the asterisk so this is a just a recommended not require element but if you see the gross pigmentation you're supposed to say is that focal is or diffuse okay let's move to histology subtype again you can see we have a lot of different types of the uh, melanoma based on the WHO classification but I'm going to focus on these um, uh, green highlighted common types right especially the uh, the first four um, subtypes those are important for possible targeted therapy I will mention a little bit more in the later uh, in my talk so let's start with the first one here you see superficial spreading so let's start with the definition again superficial spreading you have to see the inside you component like here here right uh, extend at least three reti reaches beyond the invasive component okay again here you have to have inside you component at least three reti reaches beyond the invasive component i'm sorry and this type is common in like uh yen to uh, middle age people like 20 to 50 in the area with the intermediate sun exposure so that means in the males mainly in the trunk and for the female is lower legs right and then they have a high incidence of bereft mutation that's what i mean it it's give you a great information for the potential targeted therapy so if you have superficial spreading most likely to have bereft so most likely to respond the bereft um antibiotic therapy right and again they can be associated with the um, nevus next one is nodular type so in contrast to the uh, superficial subtype this i talk uh, it's usually show shape circumscription here you can see here right uh, and inside your component never or does not extend beyond three reti ridges beyond the invasive uh, melanoma component, right? If it's uh, beyond the melanoma invasive component, that will be the superficial spreading, right? It's usually present as a rapidly expanding nodule. Most of the time, it can be a melanoma, so clinically, it can be made with a pyogenic granuloma, okay? Next one is lentigo malignar. Again, by definition, you should see confluence here, as you see, single melanocyte along the dermal epidermal junction as you see here and spreading down all the way to the uh, cutaneous appendages like you see the follicular extension here okay so it's usually occur in chronically sun exposed area of the elderly individual you see how much uh, sun damage here solar elastosis right and mainly in the head and neck area it accounts for approximately 10 percent of melanoma and the patient with a lentigo malignant have higher rate of kit mutation okay and let's move to the acrolentigenous again by definition you should see this nest and maybe like single cell here within the epidermis um, usually it show extensive pachytoid upward migration of the melanocytes. So pachytoid spread mean upward migrations of melanoma cell all the way to the granular layer, okay? And it's very common in the um, dead skin individual. And then it's approximately 80% of the dead skin individual have this uh, um, of melanoma patient uh, is acral melanoma and it's only two to five percent of melanoma in Caucasian, right? And subset of these uh, acral antigenous melanoma also show KID, BREF, or NRAS mutation. And let's move to the desmoplastic melanoma, okay? So here, I'm going to start with the definition. So 
basically it is a uh, um, spindle cells or fusiform uh, cells proliferation in the background of dense stroma. Uh, so and associated with these lymphoid aggregate, sorry, lymphoid aggregates. So this is very important histology finding that we guide you the uh, correct diagnosis, right? And that our spindle cell proliferation should uh, compose of at least more than 90% of the invasive component to call it desmoblastic melanoma. But if you have only less than 90% of the spindle cell population and the rest is more epithelial, you should call just that uh, melanoma with spindle cell feature or melano spindle cell melanoma with desmoblastic feature, not desmoblastic melanoma. Again, to call it desmoblastic melanoma, you should have that. That's uh, what I'm saying is pure desmoblastic melanoma. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit more about that here. So again, pure desmoblastic melanoma. Definition, more than 90% of tumor with uniform desmoblastic stroma and hypocellular proliferations or spindle-shaped melanoma cells. Right. So why I'm like talking about this pure or mist or desmoblastic or not, because if you have the um, pure desmoblastic melanoma, the the risk of sentinel lymph node positivity here you can see in this uh, table is very low, right? Compared to the mist type, that mean not only the spindle cell com uh, component is combined with the epithelial component or patient with the non desmoblastic melanoma. So if you have some, if I have to have a melanoma, I want to have a pure desmoblastic melanoma because it has a lower risk of having the sentinel lymph node positivity, okay? If you want to know more about that, you can read this paper published by Dr. Paretos and the co-authors, okay? And next one is lymphovascular invasion. Again, defined by the presence of tumor cells, within the endothelial line lumen of vessels in intratumoral and or peritumoral area, right? So if we see like obvious like that, we don't need anything, but in the daily life, it's not so easy sometimes, right? So if you need help, you can do immuno, uh, like a D240 or CD31, what about available in your lab? So this is just a little bit of our study from our group. So we already said that if you use immuno, it increases the detections of LVI. And LVI detected by immuno is significantly associated with poor prognostic parameters, such as acceleration, such as presence of mitotic figure, higher breast load thickness, and positive sentinel lymph node. And also, if you compare patient with lymphovascular invasion, uh, to the patient without lymphovascular invasion, you will see patient with LVI has a significantly decreased uh, disease-specific survival, okay? It's just an example like of the immuno. Like for example, this is the one showing the D240 staining with this brown color, right? Um, and here is the double staining. That's the um, current standard protocol that we are using at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So, sorry. So here you see, we use the D240 and MITF devil state and D240 highlighting the uh, nuclei of the melanoma cells and uh, surrounded by the D240 highlighted uh, vessel wall. So this is LVIs, okay? And move to the margin. In regard to reporting margin status, we report both deep and peripheral margin for both inside you and invasive components. If the tumor present within 10 millimeter from the closest margin, we report the exact distance in millimeter. Let's say we said like 0 0.2 millimeter from the closest peripheral margin, something like that, okay? And now, as I mentioned before, our pathology report contain, in addition to required elements, several others elements that may be important in patient management, right? So this green uh, asterisk, that's show the parameter that we report. So let's start with clock level. You know, we have a five clock level, right? So one is easy, like intraepidermal or melanoma inside you, right? Five is also melanoma infiltrating into the subcutaneous fat. And if four is melanoma infiltrating into the reticular dermis, right? So now between the papillary and reticular, so you know the 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 uh, line that um, divide between papillary and the reticular is the 
a superficial venous process, right? If we have a melanoma cell in the reticular dermis, that will be level four, right? But level two and three, both are for papillary dermis, right? So for level two is just like focal or uh, very minimal uh, invasive melanoma cell present in the papillary dermis. Uh, in contrast, that clear level three means the melanoma cell completely fills and expands the papillary dermis, but not invading into the reticular dermis. Yes, that is the clear level three. So be careful when you interpret this thing. It, uh, we see a lot of mistake that, again, this is just the recommended element, but we report it. And next one recommended elements are radial and vertical growth phase. So basically what's the definition of so radial growth phase is expansions of tumor, mostly in the epidermis. In contrast, vertical growth phase, expansions of tumors in the dermis, okay? In the vertical growth phase, we have two, is mitogenic or tumorigenic. Mitogenic means presence of any mitotic figure in the dermal melanoma cells, right? Tumorigenic means presence of any larger nest of tumor cells in the dermis compared to the nest in the uh, epidermis. Like for example, this nest is much smaller than the big nest in the dermis. So that means this, this uh, case, um, this patient has a vertical growth phase, okay? Uh, let's move to tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. Again, with the asterisk, that main just recommended. And we report it's that uh, present or not identified. If it is present, we're trying to say is that brisk or non-brisk, okay? So brisk, again, definition what bricks. So these are the representative picture for the bricks melanoma, right? So lymphocyte here, diffusely infiltrate the entire base of the vertical growth phase or or entire invasive component of the melanoma, and that is the brisk. Of course, non brisk is easy. If the lymphocytes are only focally present, it is classified as non brisk okay? Again, here we report the associated melanocytic nevus. So basically, first we're trying to uh, interpret is that conventional nevus or is that a dysplastic nevus? After that, again, we're trying to say is that compound type, is that gentianal type, or is that intradermal type, okay? And uh, that this is the last parameter that we report for the T staging is the uh, predominant cytology of the melanoma cell. Is that epitheloid? Is that spindle as in the desmoblastic melanoma? Or it looks like a nevoid or small cell melanoma, okay? So this is just the just a little introduction how we um, should um, do initial approach in terms of the surgical management of patient with suspicious melanoma, right? So if clinically, if you suspect that it's melanoma, you're trying to excite entire lesion with one to two millimeter clear margin. Of course, if the lesion is too large and you are not even sure that's melanoma or not, you can still do patch biopsy or even deep saucerization is acceptable. But please avoid doing shave or frozen session because you know that initial histology evaluation is really critical for the diagnosis as well as staging of the melanoma, which we determine the management of the patient, right? And this is just a management algorithm. As you know, all primary melanoma with uh, localized disease, the main thing is the why look at excision for everything inside you to T4 melanoma, right? But if you have a melanoma, uh, T1B and above, at that point, additional sending a uh, lymph node biopsy is uh, performed uh, based on our MD Anderson's criteria. Also, we perform sentinel lymph node biopsy if even the patient has a just T1A melanoma, but it's transcended at the base. So basically what we report is like at least T1A melanoma, right? Because at those cases, we also uh, do the sentinel lymph node biopsy here at MD Anderson, okay? So now I'm summarizing the changes in T classifications of melanoma in AJCC 8 edition. No overall changes in T category. The main uh, changes is just T1 melanoma, right? They removed the mitotic rate as a staging criteria. Now they divided T1 into T1A and T1B based on the tumor thickness of 0.8 millimeter and the presence or absence of ulceration, right? But 
Alceration for T category or T1 through T4 remain and change. Okay. So now we finish the first part, right? Now we are moving to the regional uh, met. Uh, that means uh, metastatic melanoma to the regional lymph node uh, is stage three. Okay. So here, just a comparison briefly seven and eight addition. Okay. And here. So before going further, as you see here, the end stage, and you will see not only the lymph node positivity, you have in transit mat satellitosis. So I'm going to start with the definitions of those parameters. Okay, what microsatellitosis? I mean, definition of by the name, you know micro. So microscopic, subcutaneous, or cutaneous mat, which usually present adjacent to the primary melanoma or deep to the primary melanoma. Okay, but you have to that uh, focus has to be separated from the primary tumor by normal tissue, either dermis or subcutaneous tissue, right? Based on eighth addition, you don't need the minimal size threshold or distance from the primary tumor. You know that previously like 0 0.3 or 0 0.5, those things are gone. So you just need the uh, real normal dermis or subcutaneous tissue that separated the mm -hmm. um, satellite lesion from the um, primary melanoma. And the other recommendation as per AJCC8 addition is if you think something is microsatellite but very close to primary lesion, you should cut additional session to see if these two components uh, connect at the deeper level. Okay. And let's move to the definitions of satellite or intransit match. So that is more clinically evident, not microscopically, right? And they usually are, are present between the uh, tumor uh, to the nearest uh, draining uh, lymph node. For example, if I have a melanoma in the, in the, uh, in the arm, it will be the satellite or intransit med will be the clinically detectable nodule between that lesion to the uh, axillary lymph node, not beyond the, that uh, nearest lymph node basin, right? And what's the difference between satellite and intransit? It's just the <clears throat> distance. If it is present within uh, two centimeter from the primary tumor, it will be satellite horses or satellite lesion. And if it is more than two centimeter away from the primary tumor, it will be the intransit mat. Okay. And this is the seven addition of the stage three or N staging. Here you see it's uh, basically it goes from zero to three, as you see here. Uh, based on the number of metastatic nodes and presence or absence of the these intralymphatic mat, or as I mentioned before, right? So you see an, an important considera um, considerations of the end component. If you have the um, intransit mat or satellite, even in the absence of the positive uh, uh, lymph node mat, state the patient a staging is N2C. If you have one or more uh, positive lymph node plus these intralymphatic mats, it will become the N3C. So you see that uh, how important it is, okay? And this is the eighth addition. Here, again, um, staging is basically similar like zero to three, right? And uh, based on the number of positive lymph nodes, and now, and clinically, a, a stent of LIMAT is that uh, microscopically detectable or macroscopically detectable. That's the previous terminology. But in the new AJCC, they use the a new terminology called clinically occult for micro and clinically detected for macro metastasis. And of course, presence and absence of uh, satellite or intransit MAT. So each and every end staging and one through and one through and three they have like three subtype A, B, C. So A is for the tumor with clinically occurred lymph node, and B is for the tumor with the clinically evidence lymph node positivity, and uh, C is for the presence of these intralymphatic metastases. So here. So now the end category of regional lymph node status has become much more complicated in the eighth edition, right? 
And again, as I said before, they change their terminology, right? So be careful when you use that. So clinically occur disease instead of micro, clinically detected instead of macro, right? And, <laughs> and you can see here these nano region of disease that micro or uh, sorry, uh, non-nodal regenerative disease that I mean is intralymphatic match is now categorized as N1C or N2C or N3C based on the pre, uh, positive uh, number of positive lymph nodes and based on uh, presence of the meded nodes. So it's not like before. It's before if you have that and you automatically become N2C or N3, but not like that. Now it's more N1C, N2C, and N3C, okay? And this is again pathology staging uh, between seven and eight edition for the stage three melanoma cases. Here you see, right? And category now it became like uh, 3A through 3D instead of just three in the previous version, A through C, right? That's the difference. Now, uh, these groups are based on multivariable model, including not only the N category element, but also the T category elements, right? Like tumor thickness ulceration here. But the previous one, everything is like T1A to T4A. The main difference is just the N. But here, it's depend not only N, it's also depend on the T parameter. So this demonstrate a significant impact of primary tumor factors in assigning the N stage group, stage 3A through 3C, and 3D is only for patients who have T4B and 3A or B or C and without uh, distant match, okay? Next one, Sentinel lymph node. So as you know, like basically there are only two techniques for sentinel lymph node, if you bind set or if you breath load. But MD Anderson, we trying to, if the lymph node is big enough, of course, of course we're trying to do breath loading and then include as many fragments as possible within a single paraffin block, as you see here. And then what we do it, after that we got one HNE, if it is positive, fine. But if it's negative, we get three additional levels uh, one for HNE, &E, one for the pan melanoma cocktail that include as 100, sorry, that include MAT1, HNB45, and tyroxinase. If if we can see any positive cells with the pan melanoma cocktail, that's fine. But if we have negative and we report it as negative, okay? And this is just the example of one of the uh, sentinel lymph node positivity here. Again, pan melanoma highlighting the melanoma cell here, right? And according to seven edition, um, uh, the isolator said now, what they said, if we found any melanoma cell, even isolated cell detected by immuno with a relatively specific melanocytic marker such mm -hmm. as HMB, MUD1 or melan A, it is acceptable, it is accepted as lymph node involvement by MAT, metastatic melanoma. HNE confirmation is no longer required. But for us to call it something positive, we still want to see the like malignant morphology of the cells, okay? And sentinel lymph node. So basically, approximately 20% of patients who under one for uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is positive. And 50% of them are in the uh, intermediate or thick melanoma that may more than one millimeter. And about 5% are in thin melanoma. And 16% out of that 20% are detected on initial HNE, and 4% of them are detected with additional deeper sessions or immunostate. And less than 5% of them show extra nodal extension. Okay, here, let's move to uh, how we report. You, you are supposed to report that uh, total number of lymph node examine as well as number of lymph node with metastasis for both sentinel as well as non sentinel lymph node. And we also mentioned like med and lymph node because that's important for the staging. And of course, uh, we measure the size of the largest metastatic deposit for both sentinel and non sentinel and report in two dimension like here. We measure two dimension. If there are multiple metastatic foci, what we do is we measure all the adjacent deposit because most likely it will show up a continuous focus if you cut deeper, right? And we also report the location of the mat 
is that subcapsular or is that intraparenchymal or is that both? Also, of course, we report the extra capsular extension, okay? This is just a bit for, of, for all the sentinel lymph node. Again, if you do only melan A, you can see the uh, positivity, this granular staining in, in the macrophage. So it can be made with the positive melanoma, metastatic melanoma. So if you have any doubt, it, it, you can do HMB45. That one is usually negative in macrophages, okay? That's uh, like a pitfall in the interpretation. And another pitfall is capsular nevus, right? So here you see the capsular nevus. So the helpful feature is, of course, location, usually in the capsule. And the other thing is morphology. If you have a prior melanoma uh, specimen, and you should compare the morphology, usually capsular nevus are smaller in size. They don't show any cytology it appear. Okay. And if you need, and then you can do other immuno if stay in doubt, right? For example, HMB45 should be negative in the uh, nevus and positive in melanoma. And you can do the T67 for prolifer if you have any doubt. And now we are moving to distant mat or stage four. Again, again this is the comparison. Just a briefly, I'm going to talk detail here. So M category has begun um, here. You see in the seven edition, we have the M1A through M1C based on the location of the distant mat. And M1A is just the skin or subjudice or distant uh, lymph node. B is for the pulmonary mat and uh, 1C for other mat. Or the other thing is you see the uh, serum lactic dehydrogenase LDH level. If it is elevated, the patient has uh, uh, it became M1C regardless of the location of the distant mat based on the seven addition. But in eight addition, you see the difference. First of all, you see addition at M1D instead um, in addition to A through C. So D is for patient with um, metastatic melanoma to the uh, C, uh, central nervous system, right? And 1A is the same basically, and 1B is for the pulmonary, and 1C change because now it's not none pulmonary. Now it became non-pulmonary and non-CNS visceral site, okay? And then again, here you can see in the new AJCC present or LD, elevated LDH, we no longer upgrade the lesion into group 1C regardless of the locations or distance mat. Now uh, we add uh, the 0 and 1 for each, uh, each category, 0 mean uh elevated no elevated serum ldh or normal serum ldh level and one for the elevated uh serum ldh level so that's a big difference okay and this is the comparison between seven and eight edition for the distant match you don't see any big difference okay so we are almost there so in terms of the reporting we are supposed to use p and n a if we want to say no metastatic, no distant metastasis in our report because PN0 and PNX is mainly for the clinical um, uh, determination, right? So we use PN1 when we see any distant mat in our pathology examination. So if you don't know, just please use PN and A instead of M, MX or MO and zero, sorry. So again, here is the comparison between seven and eight edition. What's different? I already mentioned that. And here is the summary of the melanoma parameter, right? Now, CAP protocol require in many laboratory at, in US, it is used for clinical management of the patient. Based on our experience, in review of the outside referral or consultation cases, there's a degree of discrepancy among laboratory in reporting clinically important histopathologies parameter. It indicates that there's a still need for more simple or clear definition and awareness of the potential pitfalls in the interpretation of this important parameter. Again, we recommend to report not only the uh, required element, but also the recommended element which may be useful for the patient management. Okay, so I think we are going to stop here today. And I really want to thank all of you for coming here again. And I will take any question if you might have. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it, it, it was really good, you know, I mean, it is really amazing that uh, there are very, very small kind of differences between 2000 
I mean, the, the seventh and the eighth edition, but it is still, you know, tremendous amount of information uh, that uh, is actually going into this thing. So the audience can uh, put into the chat window the questions uh, if they have. In the meantime, you know, I would like to ask you just a, 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 a couple of questions. It is very interesting, you know, that the new thickness measurement for the PT1 uh, ABC is, is basically the old breast load thickness uh, rounded up to the, you know, uh, digit basically the 0 0.76 is coming 0 0.8. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, yes. So basically what Breslau was doing originally is coming, you know, back in a big circle, you know, yes. and he was so much, absolutely, so I mean, kudos to Breslau to coming up with his fitness measurement because it seems that it is really, now we can say, you know, that all those people working on it, what he was coming up with is like amazing. And I mean, I know, yeah. it, it, it was great to see. Could you tell us a little bit about a, a few things like, uh, like insider information, but why was, because there was a tremendous work on this mitotic figures. Why was the mitotic figures, the number of the mitotic figures removed? This is one of the questions. The other question is that you showed, you know, the periodic cell spreading and the periodic cell invasion. And, you know, sometimes we have that thing, especially as scalp lesions, very, very deep down. And you made the distinction, or you, at, with your colleagues at MD Anderson, make a distinction of a perineural invasion, and you make the breast thickness to the perineural invasion, but you're mm -hmm. not using the same kind of measurement for a follicular or an odd spread. What is really the uh, reason uh, not doing that? Yes, yeah, so basically for perineural invasion, so as you said, we don't measure the periannexals or the lymphovascular invasions or satellite. For example, lymphovascular invasions and satellite, we consider that is not the uh, component of the primary tumor. The perineural invasion is still the component of the primary tumor. That's the main thing. But again, this is very controversial. We don't have any like, strong evidence that I can show you. Oh, you see if perineural invasion deeper, the patient do uh, I mean, behave more aggressively clinically, something like that. That's We are still working on it. So I have nothing to show evidence of that. Something is actually what we are doing is better than the other, not like that. So basically what I said is, this is the way that we do here because we think perineural invasion is the part of the uh, primary tumor in, and rather than the something that related to the mat. Okay, just the consumption again, I have no evidence to show right now. And in terms of the rounding edge, so basically, um, of course, in, in, our, in our institution, like academy, everything we do in detail, like two, uh, two decimal, and sometimes some people even report four to five, that I think is too crazy, but they are so detail oriented. But in the daily life, you know that, because like we have uh, other stuff to do and a lot of things. So basically, if given the one decimal letter rounding edge, will not make a big difference because the treatment will be the same because if a T1B melanoma and the T2 melanoma, they will treat the same because they will get the white localization and positive sentinel lymph node, uh, sorry, sentinel lymph node biopsy, what I mean. So the, in terms of the practical approach and management approach, there will be no difference. That's why uh, they don't like specifically say like two decimal or one, just rounding as is enough just to be consistent among the lab. Because for example, outside lab already say, uh, for example, they call it like a 1.01 .01 millimeter melanoma, they call it T2. And we got the, the same specimen, we measure very detailed and we call 0 0.98 and we call it T1 melanoma. So like big difference in terms of T1 and T, T, T2, but in terms of management, the same. Okay, that's the one of the main reasons saying rounding. And in terms of mitosis, so the previously they think mitosis for T1 staging make a big difference, but based on the additional uh, larger study, 
they did, it didn't show a lot of any, I mean, basically no significant difference in prognosis uh, for patient uh, who has a one mitosis or zero mitosis in T1 melanoma. So based on those larger study, the, the finding from that, they decided to remove mitosis as a diagnostic or staging criteria for the T1 melanoma. I see. So one last question. Uh, I mean, there is still an opportunity to ask from Dr. Aung from MD Anderson Cancer Center regarding melanoma. So please uh, use this opportunity. But if uh, uh, no one else is asking, then, you know, the other thing is, though, with this uh, PT1, D, uh, with the ulceration, that that's kind of, uh, you know, very rare bird to, to have. I mean, uh, if you are kind of thinking, and I don't know if it is your experience or not, but uh, something that is less than one millimeter in thickness, mm -hmm. it is exceptionally rare to have, you know, ulceration or something that you can truly call ulceration. Yep. Usually uh, due to angiogenic issues and not, uh, and, you know, when there is a big tumor overgrowth, there are closed vessels and there is, you know, ulceration. But usually those thinner lesion, I mean, under 0 0.9 millimeter or one millimeter. Right. Right. Hardly ever. So I don't know where this is coming from. Yeah, so basically, as you said, very rare to see the ulceration in T melanoma. So you, you have the, the very good point. So that's why in the new AJCC, they basically they divided T1A and T1B uh, based on the, uh, the tumor thickness, less than 0 0.8. T1A more than 0 0.8 to 1 T1B. And then if when, whenever you happen to see the ulceration, if the T1A melanoma became T1B. That's it. So mainly the main thing is for the thickness. 0 0.8 millimeter is very important cutoff point now. My That's, only comment to that thing is that I don't know how many thousands of melanomas do you have to look through, which are truly, you know, one millimeter in thickness and actually ulcerated. Because very rare i completely agree yes you know that's not going to affect most of the pathologists who are you know falling on this virus i mean this is my personal opinion but maybe i'm totally wrong on that no 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 i completely agree with you it is rare so as i said before that's why now the main thing t1a and t1b is a thickness the cutoff point 0 0.8 that's it yeah and the very last question is that then how do you, if someone, you have a recurrence of a melanoma, like, you know, like 10 years later, a melanoma is coming up. It is not a lymph node metastasis. Uh, it is, you, you cannot really tell, you know, it is probably a satellite lesion or a locally metastatic disease. Then how do you call these lesions? What kind of categories do you uh, use for the yes. staging? Okay, so for the recurrent melanoma, if it at the same location, and then we just use the prior, the primary melanoma parameter. But if you have the intransient match or the any satellite lesion, we will uh, uh, the staging will go to the uh, like you know p uh, it right uh, according to the previous version it will be n2c or n3 based on present or absent of the metastatic lymph node but according to eighth edition it will be like based on the number of positive lymph node it can be n1 uh, a, uh n1c or n2c or n3c yeah, but what so, if it is not a lymph node what if it is just a, like a soft tissue involvement or skin involvement? yes Yes, so the satellite or the uh, intransit is basically the metastasis in the uh, dermis or the uh, subcutaneous tissue uh, away from the primary tumor, but not uh, extend beyond the uh, nearest um, draining lymph node. So that's uh, qualifying for the qualifying to call for the intralymphatic mat, or some people call it satellite intransit mat. So those also are changed as staging to uh being like just t1 and then n0 to it will be kind of like t1 and 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 one c or n2c or n3c based on the number of the positive lymph node yeah if you don't have any positive lymph node just the just the intransit or satellite it will be just n1c yeah i see i see well, thank you so much uh it was a terrific talk uh it is a very important topic uh i would be very much interested to hear about the rest of the talk. So I know that you will be hyper busy uh, next week, but maybe we will talk on the phone and, and, and get another date, you know, because I think that everyone would love to hear 
you know, Merkel cell update. Uh, sure. That will be a, a shorter one, but, but yes. Sure, sure. I will definitely like trying to arrange another time with you, and then I'm happy to talk about Merkel cell carcinoma in next time. Definitely. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much again, and thank you for the audience for uh, staying with us because you know it was like a very heavy uh, substance, but I think that it is very important for clinicians and pathologists to talk the same language. So with that. Hope to actually we are going to have the ASDP meeting next week, but after the ASDP meeting, we will have derm talks. So until then, have a good night and take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.